Um, maybe I should just say to start off that I'm David Dean and I'm a public historian at Carleton University. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, good idea you know, to introduce ourselves, right? You know, so, <laughs> so my name is Jana Mirz and I work for the University of Ottawa and uh, for the Department of Theatre. So, uh, and my specialty is performance uh, and drama theory and practice, contemporary world. Yeah. Daniel? Thanks. Uh, I'm a professor of history at Carleton and I came to Carleton in 2014 as its strategic hire in migration and diaspora studies. Right. So, um, well, um, how we're going to organize this is we're just going to talk a little bit about how we came about to do the conference. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit for a few minutes about stereotypes. We'll open up that for some discussion. Um, then Jana and Daniel are going to introduce a couple of other themes, migration and performance, and the same thing. And then we'll uh, discussion after those, and uh, then we'll open up for general discussion and, and questions. Um, we might just begin by saying that Jana and I came together partly through uh, connections of our graduate students. Um, her interest in the past and representing history, my interest in theater, um, performing history through theater, um, through my uh, association, thanks to our, the then artistic director, Peter Hinton, uh, at the National Arts Center, sort of transformed my life into thinking about history as performance. And um, so we came together um, through our students, but also through mutual interests, and we organized a conference in I can't remember when it was now, um, history and memory performance anyway, a few years ago, and I'm reaching over looking for the book and I can't see it. Um, but with Catherine and, and Joelle and others, Louise at the Theatre Studies Department at U of O, we organized a conference called History, Memory, Performance. A collection of essays came out of that. And then a few years, two, three years ago, uh, Jana came up with the idea of having a second conference uh, on a different theme, and uh, I was really pleased to that Daniel would join us uh, from Carleton in this exercise because it's right in his. So maybe Anna, you could talk about the motives behind the conference. And yeah, then for sure, for sure. So uh, um, I've been working on the notion of migration since uh, well early two thousand, you know, and uh, the notion of exile. And um, at some point, I just felt, you know, that. Uh, it's not enough to talk about this issue from the perspective of performance studies, that it is extremely important to put in uh, the dialogue through the interdisciplinary approaches and connections, you know. So in 2015, I started working on the group, research group, interdisciplinary research group, studies and migration here at Ottawa U. And um, I think that among different initiatives we had, you know, was this conference, you know, on stereotypes and migration and performance and culture in 2017 and it was absolutely I was looking for partners you know so to think about these key terms that we will be looking at today as well notion of performance notion of migration and, and culture and stereotypes you know through, through this interdisciplinary connection so uh, I was uh, very happy to know that Daniel joined Carlton at that point right you know so and uh, I wanted to bring the migration um, department you know so on, on board you know so how this is how we started you know so and maybe uh, yeah so it, this approach you know so how do we think about migration from different uh, interdisciplinary lenses you know how do we engage in dialogue, you know, so, and what different disciplines can teach us more about this issue, you know, so that was the goal, you know, so, and I kind of passed the baton to Daniel on my left, no, right, <laughs> you know? so, so just, yeah, yeah, just to continue. Oh, thank you. Um, so it was really a pleasure to work with people in performance studies. I came to this project as someone interested in the language we use to depict and define migrants and multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. And so it was a context of 2015, images of Alan Kurdi, um, but also thinking as a historian about many of the powerful metaphors that I was seeing in academic and popular writing that was portraying migrants as alien wedges that threatened to flood, swamp, or pollute healthy and self-regulating citizens. It's the context of Brexit as well. And 
I guess as a historian, I was used to looking at these discourses and metaphors in the 1960s and 70s. Um, conservative politicians such as Enoch Powell, Margaret Fletcher, a far right Monday club in the UK that defended white majority rule in the UK and white minority rule in Southern Africa. And I was thinking about the legacies of those types of discourses on politicians such as Trump and Boris Johnson, say. Um, and to think through those politicians, one has to address the core, if not their only skills in theatrics. So engaging with performance studies made a lot of sense and it was a really rich collaboration. Um, yeah, and as a, someone from the UK, uh, engaging with people in theatre who were used to touchy-feely hugging approaches was um, uh, a useful engagement as well to help me think more about emotional intelligence. Okay, I mean, perhaps, um, yeah, shall we, I, I'll just say that uh, my interest in this partly comes from being struck by the rhetoric that Johnson and, and others were using in the UK, um, how familiar that was. And to my horror, I realized it was familiar because of 15th, 16th and 17th century English discourses about the other and about foreigners and, and um, notions of pollution, especially was, was, was a, a language that was being used. But, um, and as a public historian, you know, one of the interesting things that uh, tendencies of public historians is to think in terms of nations, in terms of national identity with fixed boundaries. And uh, we don't spend a lot of time as public historians looking at diasporas, looking at migrations, looking at those histories. And so I think this is an opportunity at uh, the conference and was also an opportunity of intervention for public to uh, a discussion in public history that needs to happen about uh, why we are so nationally focused and nationally centered and and what are, the, are there essentialisms involved in that focus that, that are concerning and which actually play into um, the objectification of migrants or the, the stereotypical definitions of nationhood or cultural imaginaries and, uh, imaginaries and um, you know, invented traditions and all of those things that we draw on from the 80s. But um, so stereotypes is perhaps one uh, the three themes we thought we'd talk about today. So I'll just, you know, I know that not everybody um, is involved in these sorts of uh, ac exercises, but one of the most important aspects of both of our conferences, I think, but particularly this last one, is that, as Jana says, it's interdisciplinary. And what she means by that is not just academic interdisciplinarity, but the fact that practitioners uh, are collaborators and contributors to these discussions. And um, people have engaged with the notion of stereotypes quite emphatically on stage and in street performances and, and so on. And, um, you know, just to remind ourselves for, for uh, general audiences, perhaps that might be tapping into this or, or watch it later. Um, the notion of a stereotype is essentially reducing groups or individuals to simple characteristics and regarding those characteristics as somehow fixed that uh, we come across words like they're natural, they're, they're real, they're essential. Um, and the effects of stereotypes is essentially to, to dehumanize the other um, or, or um, it validates discrimination and it, 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 it uh, legitimizes exclusion, particularly from public discourse. And, um, you know, Patrice Pavis, a theater scholar, has reminded us that stereotypes often come from uh, both from some fairly um, illegitimate preconceived ideas and unverified truisms. And Homi Baba has mentioned that, you know, reminded us again that, that this is a sort of problematic truth and is often expressed in excess of what can actually be, be proved if it can be proved at all. So um, stereotypes then are, are evoked, especially, I think they're current, they're, they're systemic, but they're evoked especially, uh, become very visible, uh, um, both used and abused at times of anxiety, and they create division, they um, mark difference, 
and they enable the othering. And as, as Daniel said, for us at this time, at the conference and thinking about the conference in the book, Trump's election made that extremely visible, um, Brexit uh, as well. Both of those are obviously still with us, the legacies of those that they carry on with the new election and, and the effects of the real exit. Um, but I'd add to that now in the context, rereading the book and thinking about our new contexts of indigenous lives matter, black lives matter, uh, but also of COVID-19. And, um, you know, there's been registered now officially over 600 attacks on, on Asians in Canada um, mm -hmm. uh, through the, the course of the pandemic um, in which stereotypes are often invoked. And, and even by I'm members of the Conservative Party against our um, public health officer. So, um, but for, for migrants and for, for those being stereotyped, it's, it's a matter of navigating identity. And all three of us as editors and many of our contributors have experienced this personally, a sort of sense of the stresses and strains of finding ways of feeling that you belong or feelings of unbelonging. Um, and Brexit and Trump highlighted all of those, you know, who belongs in the UK, who belongs in the USA, who belongs in Canada, who is us, and, and I guess who is them. And the the practitioners that particularly in the third part of the book and, and Ida and Cassia are, are with us, so I might ask them to contribute in just a second, but um, how the, facing the issue of how do you perform stereotypes on stage? How do you represent stereotypes? Um, how do you can trouble it? How do you contest it? How do you challenge it without finding, without reinforcing them on stage through representation, without sustaining them, um, without, um, reinforcing the polarities b between deploying, uh, representing stereotype typical migrants as objects of pity, or on the other hand, as sources of real trouble and danger. Um, and so the tactics that have been employed, and we've got a really rich set of case studies uh, right throughout the whole book. Um, I'd say one of those strategies is about giving agency to migrants to tell their own stories through oral history, storytelling, through documentary theater, verbatim theater, whatever, performance mechanisms, um, telling their own stories in their own ways and in their own words. Um, a second part from agency would be empathy, finding multidisciplinary, multi-sensory ways of performing that really enhance empathy and, and immerses audiences in experience. A third one I'd say would be um, finding ways of performance that, that emphasize connections and emphasize commonalities uh, between groups and between cultures rather than differences. Um, I guess celebrating a achievements, I've just thought of that one, that's another way of doing it. And all of this involves um, ways of storytelling that, that generate um, new questions, challenge stereotypes, contest stereotypes, trouble the whole notion of the stereotype. And it's, it's encouraging experiences that resonates with, with other people. Um, so I, you know, the third section of the book is particularly focused on practitioners um, and Ida and Cassia, uh, I, I know maybe Alda and Giorgio, uh, Michaelis and, and Nemo are here too, but I just wondered if, because um, the, the work that I, Ida did and the work that Cassia did were quite extraordinary stories that, that in, in the UK. So I just wondered if you wanted to jump in here and say a few things. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, that was unexpected. Ida, sorry, I called sorry. you Ida. No uh, warning, no warning. It's a spontaneous no performance. Very spontaneous. Uh, Ida, are you with me? Yeah. Yeah, um, I am. I am Ida, actually, but that's not Ida. So it is Ida. So it is okay. Ida, yes. Okay, Ida, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm so unprepared to answer that question. Um, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, I was thinking about your book and how timely it premiered in the UK with mm. all those, you know, foam walls and platforms and waves pushing refugees, like, um, you know, the darkest sense of humor couldn't come up with those ideas and, um, and how, how everything is really changing and uh, of course everything is changing but it's you you can feel the darkness um, and that those stereotypes getting stronger and stronger pushed over and over 
And uh, the rhetorics at the moment in press, uh, I think are very much taken from the all good school of totalitarian. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, you can recognize that very much. I, I can think about American potato book that was eating Polish potatoes, you know, in 1950s. And now is the, you know, China virus and it's, it's, it's so strong. So for me, you can't change. You, 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 you just can't because the, the machine that is, that you're going against is too powerful. So if you take on the machine, you just can't take it. And if you one person, so those are about those multiple voices telling their stories telling their stories that they're not necessarily migrant stories. So they not attach to their status as a migrant, that they're just stories that they are sharing and finding the, the points of tangency or the points of resonating with, with other people, whatever that may mean. So, you know, that's, there has been work, there has been wonderful work happening in the UK. There is a very strong push. There, there are migrant artists, um, have it's, it, it's an inter very international group uh, it involves italian polish uh, romanian artists came together and created a migrant th uh, theater group and they are now having like a big zoom meeting on the 16th i think uh, as a push to change that uh, there has been equity involved for the very first time and in a sense pandemic mm -hmm. opened that uh, that space for engagement because it made it a little bit easier for people to gather um so yeah that's my comment on it <laughs> thank you <laughs> so very quickly i was quite unprepared as well but i think <laughs> Sorry, uh <laughs> no that's fine um i think from my point of view and the meaning that my project had to myself and i think to the community i was working with was the fact that there was a very interesting connection between what was happening at the moment in that specific area in the uk and what had happened literally well 40 50 years before and the fact that history was repeating was daunting and the fact that Brexit had just dropped this bomb uh, that you know everyone was a stranger people from Europe were like evil uh, it was just impossible for me to conceive so I wanted to talk about the experience of migrants in the past and in the present and the connection that there was the similarity was incredible so the stories that I was uh, hearing from my grandparents were exactly the same as I was hearing from the people that I was working with when I was doing community theater so all these uh, people that have migrated from other countries to the UK settled so I'm talking about a Ukrainian community that I worked with some Italians some uh, Caribbean people so it was kind of weird it was so similar so I had that desire to talk about the other seen from a perspective of actually what is now the other and what is what was before and I'd also noticed that some people that had settled had started to see other people as the other. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. had, yeah, they had absorbed mm -hmm. with like what the people in the country were, but actually they were still seen as minority. So that was a very interesting kind of point of view. Do you lose your identity as a migrant? Are you always something else? What's your ethnicity in your story, in your, in your life, in your daily life, but also in your identity as whatever you end up being? So that was really what I wanted to talk about during this project. And I think we kind of did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's always so much more to do. And so, yeah, thank you for, you know, um, having us on the book. Okay. Uh, I was, oh. Sorry, oh, yeah. I wanted to pick up on this maybe, you know, so like and kind of move into the uh, section like in general and performance, you know, because I think that we're talking about a couple of things here, you know, so this repetition, you know, and the idea of stereotype. I came to this uh, uh, conference and to this uh, topic, you know, thinking about stereotype and again, more like in a historical perspective, you know, as a theater historian in a way, you know, thinking about uh, comedy, right, you know, so, and how uh, in historical context, stereotypes, you know, the foreigners, you know, so they were very often used as in comedic uh, functions, right, you know, so from Greek tragedy to Shakespeare, you know, to name it. 
And um, so I was interested, you know, how, um, you know, so with the development of, I don't know, democratic thought or whatever, you know, so this uh, uh, stereotype, this comic um, device, you know, was changing or not changing because I was thinking, for example, sometime in the 18th century, right, you know, so at the time of Lessing, you know, so with Nathan the Wise, you know, so you started seeing kind of a different approach to the foreigner, to, to the other, right, you know, with Nathan the Wise, the Jew, you know, so where, uh, you know, so this kind of uh, emblem of wisdom, you know, so in, in that play, you know, so someone who just, you know, turns on the verge of turning into uh, a figure of, um, I don't know, like global wisdom, you know, and so on, uh, and suffering, you know, and then, and, and with time, I think, you know, so the stereotype, you know, if you think about today's dramaturgy, you see foreigners more and more in dramatic function or in tragic function, right, you know, so they turn very often into the uh, um, heroes of tragedy, contemporary tragedy, and I'm really spellbound by this, you know, in a way that, that who is that tragic hero, right? You know, so, um, and how different it is, you know, to compare it again to the historical uh, examples and how unwilling, you know, um, reluctant, how unprepared, you know, that tragic hero is, you know, so for their mission, because they didn't ask for that mission, right? You know, they didn't, um, they didn't make a choice, right? You know, so, so like I came to this conference with this kind of, you know, thinking and asking how much performance can uh, re-articulate this position of foreigner today. And of course, you know, in Okasi, your work and your work either in, in every play in, in, in Laura's uh, paper and uh, in Sarit's paper, you know, so we all try to rethink the stereotype, you know, so how do we go away from comic figure, from someone who is by definition, you know, sort of lesser than someone else, you know, into someone who is, internally broken and um, because they didn't want to be there and then externally put in a situation you know so of like someone pointing fingers at all the time so um and i thought that performance on stage like more contemporary uh, more, more traditional one you know so it's very very well positioned to do that but then we also have lots of um examples of cultural performance right in the second section you know and how I was thinking how that, you know, uh, stereotype, how that tradition is resought, you know, in that different type of performance. And I kind of feel like I'm segueing to da Daniel's section a little bit more here. Maybe, um, yeah. I mean, another comedic text that really stimulated my thinking was a half hour comedy on Channel 4 called An Immigrant's Guide to Britain. And it was very helpful in terms of shifting the discourse away from um, how can immigrants be incorporated into the nation mm -hmm. or how can exotic difference be used to bolster the nation in a globalized economy, but actually thinking about what immigrants can tell us about stereotypes of the quote unquote host society. And I think that was really important in terms of so much of the discourse about managing migration is so focused on integration and settlement um, and can seem sometimes a little aggressively indifferent to what immigrants can tell uh, those who fashion themselves as national citizens about their nation. Um, mm -hmm. And that was that was very important for me in terms of providing um, these spaces for not so much experts telling other people how to manage their affairs, but how can we cultivate spaces for people to imaginatively and creatively nudge professional and routine discussions into uh, more lively and radical areas. Yeah. And we have a couple of uh, articles that really, really speak to that, but from very different angles again, right? You know, so I'm thinking, for example, for, about uh, Douglas's paper on Tarkovsky, right? You know, and on the position of intellectual, you know, so, uh, and, uh, um, you know, the, uh, about nostalgia, you know, that film, you know, so he's discussing very clearly, you know, so, and uh, how, you know, like the 
the migrant, you know, I'm going, kind of going back to question that Ida said, you know, so the migrants that carry their identity, carry their cultures, you know, somewhere else. And there is no moment when you actually forget who you are. So this whole idea about adaptation, you know, so assimilation and all of that, it's, it's a wonderful idea, but I don't think it ever exists, you know, or happens. You know, I'm going to die with my accent, you know, so <laughs> that's not going to change. And the moment I open my mouth, you know, so I am who I am because I speak this way, right? You know, so um, it's, I think it's really, um, it's, it's really important, you know, to kind of think about this, you know, like what, what, what do you think, what do you feel from inside, what you see from inside versus what other people think of you, right? You know, the whole idea of change, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big question mark. I don't believe in that anymore. I did for a little bit, <laughs> but not anymore. Um, yeah. So how are we doing, David? It's, we're doing well. We do have a question. Um, how does globalization affect stereotypes and migration? Well, I think I just kind of started talking about it, yeah. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, so about the fact that, um, well, you know, so I don't want to do a pitch kind of, but I think I should, I could, you know, <laughs> why not, you know? So because while we were working on this book, I was working on another one, you know, under the title Cosmopolitanism, oh God, you know, performing a subjectivity. And in that um, book, you know, I was thinking about this new subjectivities, you know, that many of us uh, live through and create and, and experience, you know, is this extremely dual, if not multiple selves, you know, that we become, you know, because of movement and because of the global movement. And I think that this tension between people who are on the move, who are experiencing this multi multiplicity within themselves and what Daniel was talking about, you know, the rigidity of the structures in which they have to be positioned, you know, I think this is the world we are in today. And pandemic, I think, you know, created, pushed, you know, for this tension even more in terms of that we are seeing, you know, how this globalization has become even more localization, you know, with the, um, of course, you know, we need to do that because of the health issues and because of the, um, you know, sort of health um, demands and so on, you know, but we are constantly closing the borders the borders have become even more rigid, even more closed because of the pandemic. Um, whereas people, you know, who experience multiplicities and multitudes in their subjectivities, you know, so they kind of, you know, even more sort of, you know, uh, looking at this um, rigidity of the borders, right? You know, so, and I think that um, it's extremely important to remember this, you know, so that the world is much more complex, you know, than, um, you know, the, the borders of one country and so on. Um, so to me, globalization is um, part of the uh, movement, you know, and uh, uh, sort of migratory experiences, and it affects what we understand about ourselves, right? You know, so um, it, it, it pushes, and I think it kind of, that's very utopian and very idealistic, <laughs> you know, it kind of makes people, um, hopefully, you know, sort of to try to see, to understand, to recognize this multiplicity. But of course, you know, in today's world, you know, so, and the elections, you know, down south, you know, so we don't know how, how that multiplicity will be, um, will be recognized and respected, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really interesting how COVID has affected this in, in, in so many ways, but the sharing of stories, the public historians have been galvanized to, to collect stories and find some sort of way of archiving this experience. And so you find yourself online sharing and reading stories of others' experiences that are uh, stories of everyday life, essentially, that, that resonate w w one with the other. And um, I think that's, that's paralleled also in the theater world, the performance world, because, you know, I mean, coming from an academic um, position and living in Canada, I feel extremely privileged salary-wise, occupation-wise, where I live, et cetera, very safe. Um, and, but I've got lots and lots of friends that are uh, in great danger. They've lost their livelihoods. They've, you know, the, this very precarious existence in, in the theater world, in the performance world, in the film world, and so on. And um, 
you know, a shout out to them for, for finding ways of carrying on. And one of those ways of carrying on has been online. And the, the I've had quite deep and profound engagements with theater people, you know, in, in many parts of the world, um, partly through online performances and online discussions. And, and I think so there's a very rich discussion happening out there online that I think is, is a sort of global experience. And that's, you know, I don't know where that leads to, but, um, you know, where it's going to, to take us. Um, but it's, it's been quite, um, it's quite, been quite humbling and, and quite, quite powerful at the same time. I think there is a great question for, for you, Daniel, about Stuart Hall. So uh, I think it's really time, you know, we pick up on that, you know, so about the, the Stuart Hall um, and John Cultural Walsh. production, yep, yeah. government, yep. Um, okay, yeah, sure. So I'll maybe just build on a couple of things that were mentioned about how the book contests some of the rather inauthentic narratives of corporate and sometimes official multiculturalism. And I think mm -hmm. that's one way of engaging with globalization as well. I mean, it, the book really tries to consider what happens when we take seriously the ability of people to manage their own affairs, to engage with the political and moral intelligence of everyday lived multicultural multicultures um, rather than try to confine or define it into uh, official or corporate and uh, oversimplified narratives uh, the kind of kumbaya type of approach and i think peter cooling's um, essay does a really good job about that thinking about how media outlets um, played on narratives rather sentimental kind of ostentatious parading of emotion narratives to try and elicit sympathy for refugees during the 2016 olympics in rio while simultaneously commodifying and fetishizing the bodies of migrants who were often um athletes uh, for global consumption uh, so that was a really eye-opening uh, contribution as well um, but yeah, I guess it's Stuart Hall. Yeah, yeah uh, I could love to talk about how his activist intellectual work stimulated the project, inspired the project. Uh, from my personal background, I guess I grew up, I was born in England, grew up learning about a country that is rather obsessed with snobbery and elitism. Mm -hmm. uh, this is clarified quite well in the new film, Tenet, where Michael Caine delivers a really wonderful line in response to someone who tells him that the English do not have a monopoly on snobbery. And he responds in his distinctive droll manner, no, but we do have a controlling interest. And I think that was really helpful in terms of Many people in North America associate England with Michael Caine, snobbery, Downton Abbey, etc. those stereotypical portraits. Uh, mm. Riz Ahmed, the actor, has a really good insight where he talks about people in America sell corporate multiculturalism, even though cities may be racially segregated. Whereas England sells an image of um, nostalgic whiteness, even though cities like London are um, these vibrant multiculture, multicultural centers where people are engaging with difference on a day-to-day -day basis. So thinking about the UK for me is not just thinking about Michael Caine, but also thinking about diasporic thinkers such as the J Jamaican born Stuart Hall who used evocative metaphors to contest narratives that framed immigrants as pollutants. And I think what was important for Hall was to develop migrants, um, well, sorry, metaphors about migrants that positioned them as the sugar in the great British cup of tea. Right? So asking, how do we think about political economy, where does the sugar come from, but also think about 
the sugar you stir as something sweet in something that's a staple of your everyday mm. existence. And those types of metaphors um, open up space, I feel, for more creative discussion uh, and challenge a certain type of professionalization of migration studies um, that tries to oppose ambiguity, metaphor, and irony in the public sphere. And I think that probably will connect more to things David can say about public history, museums, the ethics of cultural gatekeepers, um, presuming that certain types of provocative material have to be explained in a certain way to avoid um, the public uh, taking them in ways that may lead to misinterpretation, um, violence, etc. So these ideas, I think, are all very well connected in the life and the work of someone like Stuart Hall um, and really help us to think about the ethics of our role. And I think David spoke to that really well in terms of the ethics of our role in thinking about our privileged position, but also how we don't reinforce a position of our expertise, but use our privileged position to open up spaces um, and open up um, spaces for questioning of how that authority gets mm -hmm. perpetuated and reinforced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think The Familiar Stranger is a book that profoundly influenced me, but also, you know, coming across Stuart Hall working for the Open University in the 80s and then his commentary on the Brixton riots and what they revealed in 1981. And I was in living very close to Brixton at the time and, and Lewis and Brixton were very involved in that. And I think that um, sense of belonging and not belonging and being made to feel that you didn't belong or you did belong. And, and you know, this was as, as, as a white young man arriving from New Zealand, right? But was still labeled a colonial. And, uh, you know, what, where, where was my positioning there? Um, and I think that's something that emotionally we, we struggle with all the time. You know, it's, I think Daniel, you mentioned Norman Tebbit and, and you know, the Tebbit test about cricket is something that, you know, is a notorious statement, but is still, you know, evoked all the time and very prevalent. And um, I think Hall's work was addressing all of that. But um, we, I'm just going to, sorry, while you might, Want to jump in, Yana, while I look at a couple of things, but we've had a couple of new questions that I'll pose. Yeah, I, I was looking yeah. at them as well, you yeah. know, so, but you know what, I, I was thinking back, you know, to the stereotype question, you know, and the um, somehow connected, I guess, <laughs> with some kind of connected to what Daniel was saying, you know, but really you know so the question to me you know is and it hasn't been resolved really you know so at what point and where does the stereotype begin and where does it end you know so because i think one way or another you know so as human beings we're kind of guilty all of us you know of thinking in stereotypes and i think the way you know we approach um reality you know we begin with that right you know so the the first thing we do, we put things into the box. And then it really takes uh, a lot of energy, you know, and a lot of a goodwill on people's part to actually, uh, to, to, to deconstruct that box, you know, to work, you know, through that, you know. So, so the question to me is, um, at what point, you know, can, can theater performance, cultural performance help us, you know, in deconstructing that box, you know, in, on one hand, acknowledging the guilt and the fault, you know, faultness of this position of starting with stereotype, but also um, sort of, you know, breaking it up and so on. So there was a question about um, uh, who is um, um, kind of who, who, who has to, who can play migrants and who cannot, you know. So I think there are several sort of, to my knowledge, there are, there are at least several two, you know, sort of ways, you know, of thinking about it, you know, so in the tradition of documentary, uh, autobiographical, testimonial theater, it's kind of important that 
you know, the people who have a certain experience, you know, they come to the to us with their authentic truth, if you want, you know, and they share, you know, this truth, you know, with the audiences, you know. So, um, and there is this assumption, you know, that be, because, you know, people experience something, you know, so they have more um, right in a way, you know, to talk about this, you know. So, and I think it's absolutely okay and it should be. And I think that, um, you know, so that, that can be helpful, you know, listening to people with strange accents, you know, speaking in the national language, you know, and watching people, you know, of different colors and different, you know, appearances, you know, so who carry that weight, you know, um, of, is, is very important. And I think we have a very wonderful paper by uh, Nemo, right? Nemo, you know, who's talking about that. But then, you know, of course, you know, there's a question of fictional truth. And the question of, you know, many other writers, you know, um, like, for example, Elfrede Jelonik, you know, the, German, the Austrian writer, you know, who take this, um, um, well, responsibility, I would say, not the right, but in this case, responsibility, civic responsibility to actually talk about this, you know, and there are very different uh, perspectives on that, you know, so um, uh, my own piece kind of looks at this as well, you know, so, I really think that in order to bring, you know, the attention of politicians, the attention of general public to this issue, I think it's, it's, it's a collective project. You know, I don't think it belongs to just one group. I don't think it's a good thing to put the responsibility of talking about migration and refugees to the shoulders of migrants and, and refugees. I think people, of privilege, as we just said, you know, actually responsible for doing that, for uh, creating spaces, you know, looking for grants, you know, so um, maybe, you know, working together with the artists, you know, so I, I really think that, that it is more a question of responsibility, civil responsibility, civic responsibility than um, privilege, you know, for people who did not experience, you know, this to actually think about it, you know, so that, that would be my opinion. Yeah, I think it's an issue partly about um, being ethical about your work, being honest about your work, being transparent about your work, uh, whether you've had the experience that you're portraying or not. Um, the Julie Cruikshanks, who's an anthropologist, talks about lived reality versus storied reality, and I've always found that very helpful in in helping students think through um, their own concerns about, do I have the right to study this? Do I have the right to to investigate this? Do I have the right to stage this? Uh, what gives me permission to do it, and um, it's 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 a, a large issue I think that that many of our students and all practitioners face. You know, who gets to tell what stories and and how? Um, Diana has a question for Dan uh, Daniel. Uh, in your experience, what are the most striking differences? But I love this tea discussion that's going on in the, uh, in, in here too. Um, but what are the most striking differences between the perception and treatment of immigrants in the UK versus Canada? Okay, yeah, thanks for that question, Diana. Um, I mean, one thing to say would be, how does our collection unsettle certain forms of methodological nationalism, right? So there is a tendency to say, how do we compare immigration in Canada versus immigration in Australia, for example? But for a lot of people who are working with Stuart Hall's ideas is, and say the wonderful Montreal-born scholar Richard Eitan in, in Search of a Black Fantastic, talks about the importance of translocal identities so that it may be more productive to think about connecting experiences of immigration in Liverpool, England and Halifax, Nova Scotia or, you know, Montreal and New York or Toronto and New York as, um, you know, leading to richer, more robust analysis. Um, if one was to take on that question and, and grapple and wrestle with some of the stereotypes that are inevitable in such a broad kind of response, there is, I sense, more of an emphasis in Canada on orientating immigrants to the state. 
Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, and that leads to a certain type of propaganda um, or inauthentic narratives about, you know, diversity, equity, um, kind of multicolorism, right? Like having the lots of different faces representing um, different political and ethnic groups. And my sense is most people see through these, but the images still get perpetuated, right? Most people are challenging them. So you'll get the types of things that say the National Art Center, where it's very serious and worthy about look how we are conveying our commitment to multiculturalism. Whereas what seems more dominant uh, maybe in the media narratives and popular narratives, certainly in, in London-based media, is more of an informal network of people like, say, the DJ Benji B, uh, working with the legacies of African-American music, um, working with the lived realities of people uh, pursuing and embracing patois and that being something that is not necessarily commodified or turned to the state or turned into or reified into something that can be sold uh, as representing Britishness in the same way that it, it tends to be done in Canada. It seems to be represented more as this is how one inhabits a post-colonial metropolis. Um, the caveat to that is that that rhetoric of lived multicultural difference in the city where people are uh, working through difference or engaging with difference in the city is always contesting for legitimacy with the kind of nostalgic England as green and pleasant land uh, and it tends to be separating the urban from the rural. And so the authentic Englishness uh, still gets imagined reified as white, but centres such as London um, get to be understood as uh, vibrant, urban, multicultural, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking... London becomes, a, sorry, Anna, I was just to say, no. London becomes a sort of a... Um, a tourist destination for the English. That's how a person in Devon once said that, <laughs> that you didn't need to travel anywhere in the world, you just go to London. And but that was their, their world experience. It wasn't their experience of England. And uh, yeah. that little, what is that horrible magazine, Little Britain or that uh, Little England or Our England or something, which led a huge campaign for 30 years again for not joining the EU and then getting out of the EU. And now, of course, a little Brexit, um, Brexiteers. So, yeah, the um, tea issue is interesting that comes up because our article, Helen, uh, Helen Burkai and I talked about complicating the notion of Canadian cuisine, arguing that, you know, it's not national boundaries. So these foods get attached to national identities. So the British cup of tea came from India, says Samara, and other people are, are commenting on that. So um, what else? Oh, uh, Diana, um, question, <clears throat> just who has a right to tell stories? I think that is really, um, I think that is uh, something something that we wrestle with all the time. <laughs> Edinburgh comes second. Yeah, Edinburgh tea. Um, thistle tea, I've still got my thistle tea from Edinburgh. Anyway, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I think Jana was touching on that uh, when she talks about honesty, working honestly and ethically and, and with transparency. Um, and I think that's, that's a way in which we, I don't think there is an answer to ever say a conclusive answer, who has the right to tell what stories. Um, I think, in some ways, if it's not fatuous to say this, everyone has the right to tell stories that they want to tell, um, but they have an ethical responsibility to, to, to do it in, in an honest way and in a transparent way, um, both to themselves and to, to others. 
Uh, uh, David, you know, I think it's a wonderful segue, you know, maybe to invite uh, Lauren Sarit, whose names I see here, you know, so I don't know yeah, who else is okay. here, you know, to actually yeah. address that because uh, they do. That's their, they address right? that in their papers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so Laura, I used Era, would you, Sarit, I used Era, would you be cool, you know, to join us? Um, don't know. Yeah. Yes, hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Once again, on the we, spot. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, we should have warned you we were going to think about doing this. But <laughs> no, I, I sort of assumed. I, I sort okay. of assumed. Um, and so, 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 David, could you give me that prompt again? Just so I can think yeah, of Yeah, Diana was asking, you know, how do we solve the issue of the right to tell stories? Who has the right to tell stories? And it came from the earlier... Um, uh, question uh, from Rory, I think, about, you know, can only migrants perform migrant stories? Oh. Yeah, I mean, in, in my chapter, I was, obviously, I was looking at somebody telling his story, Hussam Abed, um, from Dolpha mm -hmm. Puppet Theatre, and, um, and, I mean, I, I don't have a simple answer for who can tell, who can tell what story, um, I'm interested in this idea of the, the lived reality and the storied reality. Um, looking, looking more at that, but um, I, I, th I think definitely. I, I mean, I was focused on both on um, Hussam's material body in the space, interacting with these material objects that fo that formed his story, as well as his um, his platform on which to tell his story. Um, and 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 so his actual material body that had lived this story and and carried the traces of the story mm -hmm. on it, in a similar way that the objects in the room, whether they were photographs that carried traces of his migration or his family's migrations, and um, and a, a map that had traveled with the show and and was decaying with the show as um, as part of this process of of looking at decay and detritus. Um, um, they they can't be separated from the piece, um, and 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 so quite literally nobody else could do that story, mm -hmm. could mm -hmm. do that piece in that way. But I think for for me because I'm interested in puppets and performing objects and material performance, there's there's a question of of when objects are in a piece and when material is in a piece, um, and. Um, and I know uh, Dafa sometimes do work with objects uh, that they get from refugee camps that they work in, um, where they ask people to bring objects to a space and they, tra they transfer those objects between them. They, hand they tell a story, hand them to each other, then the object takes on a new story and, and becomes attached to a new identity. And they're really interested in that transfer of objects. And now in the midst of COVID, in the fact that objects can tra uh, traverse borders, in a way, humans mm -hmm. can't. So right. we're we're working on some projects yeah. of of um, performing objects um, going across borders um, between yeah. communities, um, and and so in in that sense, that opens up the question of who can tell a story because the story becomes embedded in the object mm -hmm. and and shifts depending on who has mm -hmm. it. So maybe maybe there's sort of a, a opening out and a flexibility there in terms of the telling of the story. Um, um, within ethical, ethically. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sari, did you want to talk about your the suitcase? No, what probably? Uh, she... yeah. But it's also interesting. I uh, just to add like a little note, you know, to what Laura was saying. Is so of course, you know, because we're talking about the process of making theater right and it's always very collective right it's never like unlike literature maybe you know it is um a collective process when the subjectivities you know the energies the knowledge of every participant you know goes into this uh, process of making a story and i'm thinking that this is another place platform of hybridity of mix of of you know, sort of a kind of a minuscule place, you know, where we can transgress, you know, the borders, right? You know, so, and the, I, I understand, I think you now that at the bottom of the intercultural exchange, you know, so uh, was this idea of 
going towards the other, you know, so opening up and, ch and, and channeling your knowledge and sharing your knowledge with the other. So think that see it because of its collectivity, because of its communal sort of, you know, way of thinking mm -hmm. and working, you know, might be another reason, you know, why, you know, we can be talking, why we can do it a little bit better, you know, than <laughs> politicians <laughs> or media, you know, when it comes to migration, you know, so we can listen better, you know, to each other, I think, you know, and we can uh, uh, listen to and maybe learn from each other a little bit more, you know, so in that rehearsal hall, right? That, that's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. we can. Oh, yeah. okay, I have been trying to... <laughs> uh, I okay, I've been, yeah, I wasn't sure that you can hear me, so I was writing this uh, chat that I, I will try uh, to address the question of uh, telling stories. Uh, um, I, I, you, uh, okay, but I cannot start the video, yes? I okay. can't... I, okay, okay. So, um, um, number one, I think that uh, every time um, I write a, a paper, I'm telling a story, basically. Uh, and uh, it's, it seems to me that it's so natural that uh, um, everybody's telling stories and uh, we are all enti um, entitled to telling stories. And in my chapter, I was dealing with a suitcase, uh, which uh, is a story in itself. And what um, was fascinating for me uh, um, was the fact that every time somebody is getting on stage with, with a suitcase, the story is already there, and then it has to unf unfold. And, um, um, you know, that's the obviously the... Uh, power of um, a prop uh, which has so many uh, meanings and uh, has a history not only a story has history uh, a very loaded history uh, usually uh, suitcases don't appear on stage j just for the sake of uh, being there or for traveling somewhere um, so um, yes I think if I go back to the question if I um, a few minutes ago um, yes I think we should tell stories and our um, students should tell stories and theater is telling stories um, both verbally and through props um, I hope uh, <laughs> we can keep telling stories Okay, well, that's, I think that's a wonderful way to end our conversation. Um, we were supposed to wrap up at three-ish, so I think we're, um, yeah, carry on storytelling, I think is a, a wonderful way to, to finish. Um, sorry, and just following the alert, everyone says, thank you. Yes, people have to go. So um, thank you, everyone. I think this was wonderful. Thank you to Emma and Nick for inviting us to do this, to celebrate the book and to, and it's wonderful to connect with everyone online, but also to see people uh, from the our wonderful contributors as well. And uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, any final comments that people want? I really love that, you know, keep telling stories, you know. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what I think, I guess, what we're thinking about in the book is how certain types of stories get attached or fixed to certain groups and body. Yeah. And privileged, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Thanks so much, everyone. It was really insightful. Yeah. <laughs>